to simply notice when a thought arises, being aware of it without judgment or evaluation, and allowing it to pass away without holding on to it and without creating a story out of it. Training in the fourth foundation lets us be aware of thoughts arising and passing away, and realizing each will pass when we let go. Two simple practices can make mindfulness a part of our daily lives. First, we can stop whatever we're doing at any moment, and pay attention to the physical sensation of three in-breaths and three out-breaths. This simple practice grounds our attention in what's present right now, rather than in the voices and critics we carry with us. Shift. Dash. Ink from the stories and judgments we constantly create during the day. To this simple grounding practice of three breaths gives us the space we sometimes need to return to mindfulness of the present moment. A second practice is to take time to inquire into the truthful dash ness of the negative or difficult messages we give ourselves. First, take time to ask yourself whether the message is true. Second, ask how sure you are that it's true. Are you absolutely certain about what may seem like an easy or automatic truth? Third, notice how you feel when you believe the thought. Does it lead to fear, anger, sadness, desire? Finally, reflect on who you view without the thought. How would you feel if you weren't caught up in the particular mindset or scenario you're creating? Inquiry of wise mindfulness. Colon. What are steps you can take to support a regular meditation practice? What are steps you can take to practice mindfulness throughout the Day by checking in with yourself about how you're feeling, and how. Dash. Think before reacting to situations. What are steps you can take to sit with your discomfort instead of. Running from it or running toward temporary pleasure. What are steps you can take to question the. Truths that your mind. Tells you rather than automatically believing them. Identify specific instances where your mind and perceptions lie to you about the truth of a situation and how being aware of that might have changed your reaction and led to a less harmful outcome. Think about times when you felt fear, doubt, or hesitation. Now, let yourself become aware of their temporary nature. How might that awareness have led to an outcome that was less harmful? Wise concentration. The final aspect of the Eightfold Path is wise concentration. Meditation practice begins with concentrating on the breath, the body, the emotional tone of the moment, and the processes of the mind, me, dash, thus these things exist in the present moment, if we focus on breath, for example, we're paying attention to the present moment because our, breathing is immediate, it's happening, right now, dot, breathing is a natural, process that doesn't require judgment or interpretation, and so it eases the mind from the need to react. The purpose of concentration is to train the mind to be focused and undistracted. Most of us, early in meditation practice, are distracted by things around us, like a noise outside the room, a pain or discomfort. In our bodies, our own worries or judgments of the experience, or 
Dash. No more weariness, our thoughts and plans. These distractions can lead to a feeling of unease or restlessness. This is perfectly normal. In our attic, dash, tions, we nurtured the habit of distracting ourselves and for many of us, it became a survival technique. Concentration meditation gives us a opportunity to meet this habit with kindness and patience rather than resistance. Concentration, like the rest of the factors of the Eightfold Path, is a practice. As with any practice, it takes time and effort to learn a new way to focus attention. In meditation, simply noting the distraction, AC, dash, accepting that it exists, and then refocusing our mind back to the object, of concentration, is the practice. If we become focused on discomfort, thoughts, or plans, we need to first recognize that it's happening, and then become curious about it. Then we can make the choice to refocus, to concentrate on the object of the meditation. Our habitual patterns can seduce us into thinking we're doing it wrong, into judging our practice, or into giving up. Don't let them, when we observe what the mind is, telling us and react with compassion, knowing we have the power to recognize it and refocus it, we strengthen our ability to concentrate. Concentration can be especially helpful in times of craving. In dash. Instead of getting lost in the delusion that we must have what we're craving, we can trust that the craving is only temporary and refocus our attention on our intention to act wisely. This may simply be the three breath pause mentioned earlier, or a more formal sitting meditation concentrating on the breath. We can use concentration meditation to train our minds to focus on a helpful thought in the midst of temporary discomfort and the yearning for a quick fix. This may take the form of repeated phrases to focus and clear the mind such as metta, compassion, or equanimity. Meditation. It could also take the form of prayer, chanting, a self of fear. Dash. Mashin, a mantra, or another form of focused attention. Concentration. Practices can often bring a sense of well-being and peace in a time of terror. Dash. Moil. They're a healthy way to return to a balanced, resilient state when we're stressed or agitated. Sometimes when cravings or unpleasant emotions are particular, yeah, we strong. Moving the body can be the best way to help refocus our energy and find relief. Concentration at those times may mean being focused and mindful about each movement we are making. This is my foot taking a step. This is my hand reaching for the cup. Dot. After a few minutes of constant dash. Tration practice of not giving energy to our craving or obsession, we may find the intensity of the feeling has passed. The more we do this, the more we gain confidence that we have the power to relieve the suffering of our addiction through following this path and committing to this practice. For trauma survivors, the breath, the heart, and the mind can be potentially overwhelming places to place the attention. So it's traditional. Anchors like breath and body are challenging. Ask yourself, what helps? We stay present. What helps to calm your nervous system? It might be feeling the floor 
or beneath you, are holding a stone, or looking at a piece of art on the wall. All that you need to be present is to pay attention to something happening right now. If you feel powerful emotions begin to arise during meditation, there are some simple things you can do to remain present. For example, you can open your eyes rather than keeping them closed, or give yourself permission to back off from the practice you are working on. You attempt, dash, where you need to do to take care of yourself should such a state arise, Yes. dash, where that is taking some deep breaths, putting a name on your experience, such as, flashback, or silently repeating some compassionate phrases, to yourself, learning to turn our attention back and forth between chow, dash, blaming sensations and our own supportive resources is a valuable skill, that professionals call titration, you can be gentle with your practice as, you are working to develop this skill, Inquiry of wise concentration, colon. In what ways do you get unfocused or distracted in meditation? What are steps you can take to refocus your mind without judging? Your own practice. Notice what value or learning you could gain by carefully and kindly. Noticing where your mind has gone, or what has distracted you. What are steps you can take to use concentration to see clearly and act wisely? What are steps you can take to be kind and gentle with yourself? Through this process, community, Sangha, Sangha, is the third of the three jewels, loosely translated, it means community. It's where Buddha and Dharma find their experts. Dash. Sion, where we're supported in putting those principles into action. It's a community of friends practicing the Dharma together in order to death. Dash. Develop our own awareness and to maintain it. The traditional definition. A Sangha originally described monastic communities of ordained monks and nuns, but in many Buddhist traditions it has evolved to include a wider spiritual community. For us, our Sangha is our community of both Dharma practice and recovery. Our recovery Dharma Sangha is decentralized and peer-led, and Meetings should be open, safe, and accessible spaces that try to uphold our four principles of mindfulness, compassion, forgiveness, and gen. Dash. Arrow fatigue. The advice in this chapter comes from the collective experience of hundreds of local groups, and so it's offered in the spirit of friendly guidance rather than direction. The essence of a Sangha is awareness, understanding, acceptance, harmony, integrity, and loving-kindness. Recovery begins when we learn to pay attention to and investigate experience in the present moment. It's through the Sangha that we first learn to be fully present, that we stop trying to satisfy our craving and turn to an understanding of our thoughts, feelings, sense experience, and actions that include others. This understanding is fundamentally relational. Dot. Our actions have conse, dash, quenches on not only our own lives, but also on the people with whom we meet and share experiences. Many of us learned this the hard way, by hurting the ones we loved while we were in active addiction. A core part 
Of our recovery includes making amends to those we have hurt, including ourselves. As we've seen, our recovery includes the wise intention to heal the suffering we have caused others and to act wisely to avoid creating the same suffering in the future. Sangha provides the opportunity to practice a central part of recovery. Remembering. Dot. Remembering our past suffering and reflecting on our current path supports our recovery and energizes our practice of compassion, loving kindness, generosity, and forgiveness. Sharing needs. Reflections with others who are also struggling with addictive behaviors helps give us confidence in our own ability to recover our true nature, our potential for awakening. Sangha enlarges our perspective and begins to give us the self-confidence and self-respect that will let us reflect on the ups and downs of recovery without discouragement or hopelessness. When we feel inspired to practice with wise friends, we can trust them to point out with compassion when we fall short of our intentions. And we can be honest with ourselves. The teachings of the Buddha clearly stress that this is not just something we can do on our own. And many programs of recovery in that Including our own emphasize the importance of going to meetings and working with others in recovery. Not every meeting is going to speak to you. Keep trying new meetings until one resonates. It's with the support of others that so many of us have found relief from the suffering and isolation brought on by our addiction. It's through being of service that we've been able to get out of our own heads and experience a more soothe, dash, attainable and authentic joy than our addictions have provided. Many of us have found that there's a quality to our meditation that's different when practiced with a group, particularly when we're get, dash, Started, it can be easy to give up or space out after a few minutes. Practicing with others can often give us the motivation to stick with it long enough to start experiencing some of the benefits of practice. And through sharing our experience and listening to what others have to say, we can see how we're not alone in a lot of our challenges. This can come as a welcome surprise after years of suffering, shame, and feeling like an outcast. Many of us, having habitually isolated ourselves, have found that sharing silence at a meeting creates an atmosphere of trust and can be a calming way to get used to being with others. No one is required. To speak or participate in meetings, passing is always an option when it comes time to share. There's never any requirement requirement to believe in any dash thing to identify yourself in any way, much less to become a Buddhist or serious practitioner. The wisdom and tools are available to everyone, wherever they are on their path. But not every meeting is going to be a fit for every person. You may live in an area where there are several different options to choose from, or there may be only a single recovery meeting near you, or none at all. Fortunately, there are also online meetings, many of which can be joined by phone. You can also start your own meeting. However you find them, trust that there are wise friends in a 
Senga out there for you. Isolation and connection. Addiction and addictive behavior can create people without roots. Some of us have been uprooted from our families and from society. We wander around, feeling as though we're not quite whole. He, Dad, Thus our addictions feed our isolation and loneliness. Many of us come from broken families, feel rejected or have been isolated from society. Through incarceration or institutionalization, not all of us have this gone. Dash. Connected to that degree, but we do tend to live on the margin, looking for a home, for somewhere to belong. A community of practice, a sangha, can provide a second chance to someone who has become alienated from society, or just a comfortable place to bring all of ourselves, including parts we don't usually share with others. If the community of practice is organized with cultural humility and an open, friendly, compassionate atmosphere, we can find support for our practice and recovery. In our addictions, we self-medicated or engaged in behaviors that helped us deal with the pain of separation. The relief was temporary. Of course, often leaving us more lonely and isolated than before, yet we return to it again and again. For many of us, it was the only way we knew to relieve the pain. Even in sobriety, when faced with well-meaning, but insistent people telling us how to overcome our addictions, the end. Dash. Stink for many of us is to keep to ourselves. It's a habitual way of being. In the world that a lot of us share. It wasn't just getting high, though for a lot of people in this. Fellowship and outside it. That was the main road we took to escape. There were other traps that snagged us, even if we never struggled with. Substances. Sex, food, self-harm, social media. We may have tried to get help with those compulsions, but often found others minimizing or trivial. Dash. Believing them, especially in comparison to drug or alcohol abuse. For those of us whose primary addictions are around behaviors and processes, we may have felt alienated and excluded from recovery itself. Many of us found ourselves like raw, exposed nerves when we stopped using those ways to escape. And sometimes, the last place we wanted to be was in a room with strangers in a circle of chairs all facing each other talking about how we can't drink or use or participate in our destructive behaviors anymore. The paradox is that it's in that kind of space, where we're accepted as we are, that we can begin to let go of our reflex to hide. Many of us lost the ability, if we ever had it, to form relations. Yeah shifts without the social lubricant of alcohol or drugs. Sometimes that was because we dealt with rejection, trauma, or loss at an early age and became anxious and avoidant around others. Or maybe we just felt this. Dash. Parent from everyone else since the day we were born, or came from a small community or a big family and got sick of people nosing into our business. Whatever reasons we had to isolate, we got to a point where it stopped serving us. The substances and behaviors we used to protect ourselves began to harm ourselves and others. We drove people away too. 
be safe, and as a result we became even more lonely. Many of us are perennial outsiders. We felt abandoned by our own families, schools, religious institutions, the government, and so she dash. Eddie's marginalization of non-dominant identities. As a result, we came to mistrust organizations and groups, and even the idea of belonging in dash self. The double bind there, of course, was that because we never allowed anyone to get to know us, we cut off the possibility of ever belonging. The Buddha taught that nothing and nobody exists on its own. He said, since this exists, that exists, and since this does not exist, that does not exist. We're connected to other people through the way we interact, through the air we share, through our existence together in Na. Dash. Ture. Trying to ignore or resist this interconnection is basically trying to destroy something which already exists. This doesn't mean that we're literally dependent on others for our life and our existence, but that the life and existence of everybody and everything develops through their relationships with things outside themselves the food they eat, the environment they live in, the history, and the circumstances of their world. It's a great web of being that each of us is connected to without any effort of our own. And being aware of that connection gives us the ability to have meaningful and positive relationships with others. It is a choice each of us has to decide what we want to do with the reality of our connection. Sangha, in a very broad sense, means being willing to let other people in, to let them matter. To do that, we have to be willing to allow other people to let us in, when we can even consider the possibility of that happening, there's the potential for us to move toward liberation. And the benefits are felt almost immediately. All of us, during our development and experience of life, had X dash experiences that have made us doubt our own voices or the value or with dash dom of expressing those voices. Many of these doubts contributed to the suffering we experienced during addiction and have continued to make it difficult to connect to our own recovery. Our meetings are intended to be places where we can feel safe and comfortable authentically express dash in what we really feel and experience. However, many of us, because of past experiences in both social settings and in the recovery community struggle with this we often struggle just to understand our feelings and experiences your recovery sangha can be one that focuses on helping and encouraging those many voices often for those of us who identify as BIPOC LGBTQ, or other non-dominant identities, we may wish to attend affinity meetings with others who share our identities. Affinity meetings can be a good place to start feeling safe, seen, and heard. If you're interested in an affinity meeting that does not exist, we encourage you to start one. Our program is one of empowerment, and that includes the support of collective healing and the cultivation of resilience in order to recover our true nature from the suffering imposed on us. 
In the Buddhist tradition, it's not just that we don't have to do this work alone, it's that we